fact, in a matter of uh, 48 hours, we're seeing some crazy stuff on the news. We're seeing uh, things that I don't think anyone expected. And I was reading some blogs last night, and it was really interesting. There was a lot of questions. This is a local blog, so meaning North Carolina, but really interesting how many people asked if they could change their vote. And, um, what? You know, yeah, so I don't know what is causing it, but I think with the, uh, with a lot of new information being put across the airwaves about, um, you know, something other than the current president, I think it's caused a lot of people to second guess a lot of things and who knows what's true, but, uh, boy, it, it just does not seem like this election's going to. Uh, reach the finish line without a lot of uncertainty and change. And hmm, I think the market might be reflecting that today and yesterday. You know, yesterday was a nosedive. Uh, we have a similar setup today, which we've been writing about that for months. We expected the market to get a little volatile going into the election. So I don't, I really don't think any of us are walking around surprised. We certainly didn't have our head in the sand. We've we uh, we started talking about this, um, gosh, back at the beginning of the summer, really, and so no shock, but it uh, it's going to be like that, I think, over the next several days until the markets know who's going to be in the White House on January twentieth. I think we're going to see the volatility. So it's here to stay for a while. But again, we've been saying that all summer. Oh, yeah. And if you haven't read our market perspective, go to our website, to our blogs. And um, Phil's latest market perspective was just put out this week. And it speaks to that. Um, the past couple of market perspectives have. So he's right. We've been chatting about it for a while. Yeah. And I think the the most important thing that we talk about is, um, you know, instead of focusing so much on the volatility, companies like BlackRock and so many other great wealth management firms or mutual fund or ETF firms, uh, you know, the one thing that they've proven through the decades is trying to time the market based on an election. It's never worked. Mm -hmm. uh, we get volatility, but it's usually short lived and, and it's typically not something that creates major problem for portfolios. They generally recover pretty quickly if they go down. But I think the, the biggest problem that the consumer has is when they sell out, it's trying to get back in. Mm -hmm. And and then all of a sudden, you've got this race to time it just right. And no one's ever done that effectively. So we're, uh, we're off about 8% in the last several days, which in our opinion, creates buying opportunities. So right. not a time to race to the exits. Um, if you believe in this economy and you believe in our country and you believe in these companies, uh, you know, we're talking about some of the best companies in the world. If they're all gone, we got a much bigger problem. So in our opinion, you stay invested with great picks, great selections, great stocks, and, uh, and you buy them when they're coming down and uh, in increase your holdings. So Maybe some good opportunity here. Yeah, we won't call it a great day, but in our eyes, it's pretty pretty awesome day to go by. Yeah, yeah. Between yesterday and today, we've got a nice pullback here, and and uh, some things are on sale. So, we'll see how that turns out. Uh, let's let's talk a little more about uh, conversation for this show, uh, which is going to dig us into real estate, an unusual topic for us, but we're going to talk about real estate. We are, and. Phil says it's unusual. However, we are here for planning purposes. And when you are buying or selling a home, which is those are the two sides of the coin we'll talk about today, you need planning in place, you know, especially with interest rates so low and everyone's, you know, a lot of people are moving remote for work. So they're saying, oh my gosh, I can live wherever or I can move. I have all of this cash right now and yeah. interest rates are low. Yeah. So people are, this is a hot topic. I think everyone, it's at the forefront of their mind. You know, that's a great point. We do talk about real estate a lot. Oh, it, it goes into every plan that we construct. And it usually represents for the average American, it represents the largest asset that they own. So, you know, um, to that end, you're right. We talk about it a heck of a lot more than maybe I give credit to. And and so I, I think maybe it's a, maybe it's a better subject than I realized. But, you know, we're in an interesting time with interest rates being at all time lows, we've, we've seen 
we've had clients refi or buy new properties. Oh my gosh. Two and a half percent on a yes. 20 or 30 year note. And yep. my goodness, that's enough to get anyone's attention. I think you're right with the remote workforce and all these other things going on. There's a lot of moving parts right now, but I think people are motivated to buy first because there is this, uh, this thing in the air. It's not just the low interest rates. It's the excitement that real estate has rebounded so much post COVID and it is setting records all over the country. So I think people, you know, we talked about herding biases. Yes. So the more people that buy, I think the more follow. So everybody gets excited and let's go buy a house. And I think that's happening. But then if you add low interest rates to that, man, you get a recipe for some major selling, major buying. It is truly, truly a seller's market right now. If you want to sell and make some money on your house, as long as you want to move. So your, your point is, does it make sense to do this? Right. But if you are ready, then yeah, absolutely do it now, put it on the market, but be sure you're ready because if you put it on the market, the average sell time is less than three weeks right now. It is crazy. And I hear a lot of people talking about one day, two days, three days with multiple offers. Right. Yeah. It's crazy. We have our neighbors to the back put up their intracoastal sign that says, um, not coming soon, something to that effect. And I have a feeling somebody's going to snatch it before it actually. It'll never hit the market. market. No, I don't think it will. Never get the the full listing out there before mm-hmm. people are calling to, to yep. look at it. And the, and the listing's not on Intracoastal's website yet either. So I have a feeling, because that's been up probably two weeks, I have a feeling somebody's already swooped in, has contract on it. It's nuts. Um, you know, you went through a home purchase this year. You saw how fast homes were moving. Oh, boy. Um, yeah. we, we sold and bought. And literally, we put our home on the market on a Wednesday night, and we had a live contract at a couple of offers coming. But by Friday, we knew it was sold. And even the negotiations Mm -hmm. were done mostly by Friday and contract signed on Saturday morning. So three days and it was out. It is crazy right now. So if you don't want to sell your house, do not take a chance to just, you know, a lot of people say, let me just see what'll happen. Let, let me just see, see. somebody's going to buy this for an yeah. outrageous price. They will. Don't put it on the market unless you want to sell it because people are paying, they're overpaying. They're getting into these bidding wars, particularly if the home is in a certain price range. Mm-hmm. So speaking of price range, what can we afford? What should we afford? What does this look like, Sarah? So this is an interesting question. It is. And really we go to the lender's Um, because they're the ones at the end of the day that set a lot of these boundaries because most people are not paying cash for their home. You know, they're getting a loan. Um, And I know when we were working with lenders and I read it across the internet and I've seen it in my studies too, 28 to 30% um, is really of your gross monthly income is what you want to be paying towards your mortgage. Um, And that's what they are looking for on whether or not you'll get approved or not. Everything with a bank is debt to income ratio driven. And if you have too much debt, they're going to push down the amount of mortgage you can qualify to receive. Mm -hmm. And and so it all goes into the same bucket when they're looking at your cost. And so gross income and, and then all of your expenses. So everything and then how much mortgage can you afford? So the mortgage piece can be roughly 25%. And I think they typically want to see 35, no more than 40% total debt to income. Is that about right? Yes, that's about right. I know I was working with Jason on one of his clients and I don't know what they were purchasing, but we were working with the banker and that was, that was kind of the magic number. I think if you're at 40 or under and you've got great credit, boy, now is a good time to be buying. You can get a lot of home, low interest rate, Lock it in. You you can lock it in. I mean, I have not, I've been in this business a long time. I've financed a lot of things and I've owned a number of homes and I never remember interest rates being sub 3%. Well, they are. Not for 30 year money. Right. You know, maybe 10 year money, maybe 20. We've seen it get close to that, but mm-hmm. uh, even in the you know, at the height of the recession in, uh, say, 2009, 10, when rates were falling, but not 
not two and a half. And I've, I've been hearing numbers consistently around two, five, two, six, two, six, four, two, six, five. That is cheap money. And a lot of experts think it goes lower before we hit next summer. Which, which is insane. I know we have, I had a recent meeting with clients down in Georgia and we were discussing refining for them. And, you know, there's that sense of urgency yeah. for people right now. So they're panicked. Oh my gosh, your interest rate's going to rise. I yeah. said, you know, don't like, don't let this be a stressor. You know, it shouldn't be a stressor. And I, I think you're right though. A lot of people are beginning to have this, this real sense of consternation and they're thinking, oh my God, rates are going to go up. Mm-hmm. Well, drastically and real quick. Yeah, that's what they're thinking. They're not. Uh, there is absolutely nothing that's going to drive rates. The Federal Reserve, just so everybody listening knows this, the Federal Reserve has made it clear that while they were looking for a certain level of inflation to think about raising rates again, now they have made it clear they're going to let inflation overshoot simply because they want to be sure that the economy is on solid footing. We don't really have a lot of inflation in the picture right now. It is starting to show in mm-hmm. certain areas, and particularly in areas that have been overrun, uh, like building. So the housing market, we've seen lumber prices and materials go up. in Well over inflation. I mean, they precipitous. Yeah. It's been crazy how much they've gone up. You know, someone told me recently that a two-by-four that costs $2.50 today is selling for around $6. So that's a huge increase. So we're seeing some big time change in those costs, but overall mm-hmm. inflation is not a major issue at the moment. So to think that rates are going to all of a sudden rally. And then here's the other thing we've just put, uh, we, we've just put about what se- several trillion dollars on the balance sheet. Um, and they're talking about another multi-trillion dollar deal mm-hmm. that by itself says that interest rates aren't going up anytime soon. That is going to absolutely depress uh, rates. So I'd say if you're trying to make a decision, don't be rash. Right. Just chill. Take a chill. And And take a chill pill. You got some time here. Don't don't get crazy. (laughs) Don't get crazy. One thing to not get crazy about is how much home you can afford. So we're talking about that. And a lot of our listeners may know, and some may not, you know, if you've never bought a home, if you're in a certain age range, um, Purchasing a home is Greek, and until you go through it once, you're really not going to understand all of it. I can speak from experience on that. It's true. Um, But there's a lot of things that go into that monthly payment that, again, your lenders are going to look at. Uh, Those are going to be principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. (laughs) Mm, Boy, nobody likes that one. (laughs) No, nobody likes the taxes either. No, well... Obviously, taxes are a big deal. Uh, It's been one of the things most talked about heading into this election. So if you don't like taxes, uh, pay attention to that. But principal interest taxes and insurance, that's a lot going into what most people think is just simply a payment for the home. Oh, absolutely. But that payment is driven by multiple factors. And in addition to these, you know, insurance would, you're speaking of traditional homeowners homeowners insurance. But then if you live, say, where, you know, Sarah uh, and I live on the coast. Mm -hmm. And and so on the coast, you have another set of insurance. If you're close enough to the water, you might be obligated or required to have flood insurance and wind insurance. And all of a sudden, that can add significant dollars to that mortgage cost because they'll bundle all of that with these other things that uh, Sarah's talking about. So I have seen flood uh, or wind and flood insurance uh, be in the ten to twenty thousand dollar range if you're living near or on the water or mm-hmm. in a flood zone. Right. And there's a lot of flood zones around here. Yes, absolutely. And another one is PMI, so private mortgage insurance, and that is if, say, you don't have the cash flow to put twenty percent down at the moment, but you can still lock in that great interest rate. You really want to do it. You have to add PMI to that monthly payment, and that can also just really skyrocket that monthly payment. Yeah, a lot of people don't want to put the down payment Mm -hmm. into their new property, or they don't have it. Right. So you take a lot of folks right out of school. Maybe we'll take a doctor, for example, or a dentist. They can qualify for nearly 100% of their mortgage, and that's because the bank believes that they're a good risk. They're going to be able to make enough money to pay that debt. Mm -hmm. Well, 
having to pay that extra insurance can be pretty costly. And it also, it's there for a reason. And there's a reason why 20% is the number. So we won't get into those details, but I'll tell you, if you don't have enough to put as a down payment on a home, now might be the only time that I would say, okay, maybe we'll consider doing it Mm -hmm. because interest rates are so low. So you've got an incredible offset right now, but generally speaking, you need 20% down to give you a much better set of numbers on that mortgage. And it, it creates less risk for you because we saw in 2008, Sarah, when, when um, home values took this incredible nosedive, people that didn't have enough equity in their homes, they were upside down. And so all Oof. of a sudden, these uh, repossessions, if you will, or foreclosures were happening. I mean, it, no matter where you looked, there was foreclosure going on everywhere. And a lot of that was because not enough equity had been built in that home. So they were financing way too much money. And back then, you may not remember this because you probably weren't buying a home then, but no, I was sitting in English. Yeah, you you were still in. Yeah. So, so, but, but in that period, we had no doc loans. Mm -hmm. So you didn't have to show your tax return or anything else. I, yeah, I can't imagine this. I mean, you remember what your banker asked for when you bought your home. Oh my God. Everything but your left arm. They wanted to come live with us for a month. hundred percent. And, and they probably asked you for your firstborn. So here you've got to give all this data, but back then, I am not exaggerating. You could walk into a bank and you could do two, you could choose one of two programs. You could do a stated income. Mm-hmm. So you just simply said, okay, I make X dollars. And you'd pay a little higher interest rate for that, but they took you at your word. Yeah. Right. Or you could do a no doc and a very little documentation that the bank needed. And I think everybody knows that ended in a really ugly uh, way. So we had a calamity to say the least. Today, I think people realize that putting a good down payment on a home makes a heck of a lot more sense because then you have a little bit of leeway there. If if markets come down a little bit or real estate values come down, you're not going to be upside down that quick and you have less of a, there, there's lesser chance for a foreclosure. Right. So, So the main point of all of this is when you are buying, make sure that you are planning for everything. Um, a couple of things that I don't think I even put on there were closing cost, inspections, yeah. moving cost. Yeah. Those are a huge, they may be one-time things, so you're not really planning to do that monthly, but that is a very large cost that you may not be prepared for. You may not realize you're going to have to dole out. Well, and, and here's one of the things, and I blame this a lot on bankers uh, because some of them are not thinking about the the financial solvency of the client in every way that they should. They're thinking mm-hmm. about, can they make the payment? That's all I really care about. They want to get the, the, the mortgage in place. That's how they get paid. Mm-hmm. But I think a lot of times um, they should step back and recognize that when they show a, a person how to roll all of those expenses into the mortgage, Oh, gosh. Right. So, so for example, they'll say, hey, you qualify for this. Let's just do all of this. You can get some cash back at closing, and, and that'll cover all these costs. You're paying for those things over 20, 30 years. And so that is a huge mistake, but I see it being made all the time where new furniture or upfit cost, all these things, they get rolled into a mortgage, and you pay for those things for a long, long time, which absolutely increases their cost. Oh my gosh. So we, my husband's military, so we went the VA route. I, I don't believe VA allows things like this they for, don't. for good purposes, you know, to keep you in a good financial standing. So we had to write a lot of checks. <laughs> a, I had to go get, buy a checkbook actually, because I didn't have one before. So I went to the bank and said, I need checks. She gave so me You're three. all electronic, right? Absolutely. Yeah, of course. So she gave me three and those were going like that within the first week. So you have, I mean, you are writing a lot of checks. I know with us, um, you know, I am fortunate to have a wife who is um, well versed mm-hmm. in, yeah. in money. <laughs> She's a CPA uh, by education and a CFO by trade. And and I don't have to do a thing as much as I have to talk money, uh, no pun intended, 
every day. It's my, yeah, I know. Um, we need sound machines. You know, we have some sound things over here on the board. I Don't need go to start press using on the case. We've case yeah, we pre-recorded I'm, stuff. My, well, they are, but I've got these cool little sound snippets. I could put those on. There's one that does what you just did, which is the little drum mm-hmm. thing. Yeah, okay. I might, we need to learn how to use those. So, um, but, but she has taken care of all of that. And I think maybe I've written one or two checks this summer with the, this transition, but I can't tell you how many things she's had to, to write checks for. So it is not simple and you need to be prepared for that. Yes. And if you, again, my loan wasn't, you're not allowed to, to roll it into your mortgage. And I, I, obviously I'm thankful for that because I didn't even see that that was an option, but you just, I'm, I'm not kidding. There's so many little things and so many inspections and so many different people to pay. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah. oh boy. Yeah. yeah. Make sure when you're buying a home, you're doing a lot of planning. Yeah. That, that might be the best advice anyone can hear. And, and if you're a listener that isn't in the market for buying or selling, I bet you've got friends or family or grandchildren or children. They might be in the market. Make sure you coach them on these things if you haven't already. And if they need a little bit of guidance, we have a number of uh, white papers and pieces that we can send to them. And we're happy to share that, that those things are really designed to talk about these basics Mm -hmm. and make sure that you are knowledgeable in, uh, in, in this realm of life. You need to know how to buy and more importantly, you need to know what the blind spots are so you can avoid them. Absolutely. So let's, again, flip the coin to selling. Phil said, you know, it's a seller's market. You put it on the market and it's gone. You're you're probably going to get what you ask for too. Yeah, and maybe more. You know, my brother sold his house this summer and uh, he and his wife were shocked that it sold so quickly. Uh-huh. But his realtor said, set your price, mm-hmm. but be sure that's all you want. Oh. Mm. And <laughs> they're in South Carolina, correct? Yeah, they're okay. in South Carolina. And he called me and he said, you know, what, what do you think about this? And I said, well, if that's what she said, she knows her market. And uh, sure enough, it, it sold in, you know, it was just a matter of days. Maybe it was a week or a week and a half, but it was sold quick mm-hmm. and uh, really no, no caveats. It was, uh, it was a quick close kind of thing. And um, yeah, so I, I think it is a seller's market by and large. I was talking to my my uh, wife, Natalie, the other day, and she was telling me about the number of closings that, that their company is seeing all the time every day right now. And they're setting records, mm-hmm. um, it, which is amazing. And and I know that Intracoastal Realty, um, you know, a company that's been around here more than 40 years, they're not the only one, even though they're one of the largest um others are feeling this same effect. And so they're having to cap, they're having to say, you know, we will not accept any more, especially closing attorneys and uh, And lenders. Yeah. 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 I was talking to um, one of our favorites. uh, Let me guess. Leon. (laughs) I was on the phone with Leon yesterday and he said things have finally leveled to a point that he can catch up a little bit. Yeah. But uh, you know, that, that's a sigh of relief, but he said, that doesn't mean we've gotten slow. He said, we mm-hmm. are still j- just hitting it as about as hard as they can. And then um, our folks at, at national national finance. Yes. They have been just unbelievably slammed all year. Crazy. I yeah. was talking to one of them uh, just a few days ago and he said, you know, we're at a point where we have to say no mm-hmm. to some people because we just can't keep up with the loads. So um, yeah, it's definitely a seller's market. So if it's a seller's market, what do the sellers need to know? Mm-hmm. Um, what's most important? What can we tell them today that helps uh, give them enough advice or enough information that they make a good decision? Well, one of the questions you ask yourself is, are there potential buyers? And we've answered that 10,000 times already today. Yeah, there's potential buyers. Yeah. Um, I will say if your house is over and Phil, you can correct me, I believe it's over one to one and a half to two million. That market is not quite as hot as the the more affordable homes. That's a true statement. Yeah. Um, so if you are at that price point, that would be something to consider. Are there potential buyers and do you have a plan in place if you stay at that home, especially if you're planning on downsizing? Yeah. So you're anticipating things getting cheaper. You may have to hold on to that home a lot longer than you think. Yeah. That market is getting a little better. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, I rely on Natalie a lot to help me understand how that market's working. And then, of course, nationally, you can find those numbers. But 
that market has gotten a little better, but usually people that are spending that kind of money, they're going to go uh, the custom build route. Mm -hmm. They're going to do what they want to do, get what they want. And, and probably they're not going to be buying a home like that. And if they do, as a seller, you should expect a lot of potential negotiation. They're going to want to they're going to want to deal because probably they want to come in and renovate mm -hmm. uh, and they're going to give themselves room to do that. So as not to overspend in total mm -hmm. on that property. So if it's a, you know, if it's a million dollar home, we see a lot of negotiations that are 15, 20% off of that price in some cases. So. Yeah. So that's a different yeah. situation. So keep in mind, the price point has a lot to do with what we're talking about today. Yeah. Really here, we're talking about 750,000 down mm -hmm. and, and the, the next the next rung or category would be if you're at about 300 or lower, they are flying off the shelf. That's the fastest selling market or that's the fastest selling price range mm -hmm. today. All right. So say you sell your home and your basis is very low and you're going to make a lot of capital gains. There is one saving grace. You can exclude up to 250 on those capital gains. You can actually do 500 if you're married filing jointly. So that is a huge break in taxes. It's giant. If you've got a if you've got a lot of equity in your home and that thing has appreciated and your home, let's say you paid 250 and today that home's worth a half million, you got zero capital gain as long as you've lived as in it. As long as two out of the past five years. Two out of the past five years. That's what yeah. classifies it as a permanent residence or primary right. residence. And if you don't fit that. If you don't fit that criteria, then be careful. You're probably going to owe some pretty significant capital gain taxes. But if you were to sell now, assuming that uh, we're in a lower capital gain bracket than mm -hmm. we will be, should um, the former vice president, Joe Biden, if he's elected, our understanding is we could see those gains go up. So I suppose the benefit here is if you sold it now, your capital gains are likely lower, depending on who you think gets elected. Uh, that'd be a chance you have to take. But if it's your personal or your primary residence, mm -hmm. and you're married to your points there, you can you can take away up to a half of a million dollars in gain, zero tax and different from the old rules. You don't have to reinvest that money, the sale or the proceeds don't have to be reinvested in another residence. And that right. used to be the kicker, almost like a 1031. If you didn't do that, you were going to spend a lot on taxes today. You've got up to a half million as a couple, as long as you're married filing jointly. I mean, what a win. That is such a win. And 1031 has come up with a couple of clients that is going to be investment property. So you can't use that on your private residence. So if you have heard of that and you think, oh, I'll do a 1031 exchange, that that's not going to work. Yeah. You know, for example, if you bought a home and this has been happening around the coast here a lot, and I'm sure it's happening in other parts of the country, but uh, we just heard one of our clients yep. was just sitting in here last week, and he told us that that someone sold a home and nearly doubled their money yes. in two or three two, years. I think it was three years, yeah. Crazy, but this this person sold that home for almost double. So this half million dollar thing comes into play in a big way. Oh, absolutely, because it was a very expensive, very, yeah. very good location home in Riceville. Night 900 and sold it for 15 or 16. 16 I think, yep. I mean that is insane. <laughs> so what a great deal for him. But I think if you didn't plan properly, you you could get hit with some pretty hefty taxes and in his case, pretty sure it might have been a rental, so 1031 now comes into play. He's going to use a lot of that money, I think, to build a new home or buy a new home for himself. Correct. He was um, purchasing land and then building on that land. So he. So that made sense for him. Yeah, for sure. I mean, what a what a heck of a deal uh, that he got there. So know the rules. Otherwise, you're going to be subject to some tax. Definitely know your tax consequences. Know that you have buyers or not know, but plan on how long you think it'll take for your house to leave the market. Um, you don't want to go buy another $3 million, $2 million home and then be stuck holding one for a few years right. and it stretch you thin. Yeah, I agree with that. There's, um, there's nothing like good planning. And, you know, we see it a lot in, in our industry, in our profession. We see 
more and more the need for planning because so many people, they just don't plan. They make these impetuous decisions because they get excited or they follow the herd, whatever it is. So it could be one of those emotional biases that we talked about a few weeks ago. That generally leads to mistakes or regrets and life's too short. You don't want to live with a lot of regrets. So plan first, purchase second, be sure that what you're about to do makes sense. And if you're not sure how to plan for that, reach out to us. We've got all the technology to help you do that. In fact, if you want to do it, uh, we can give you access to some of our, some of the more simplified versions of what we use and uh, allow you to see some of the before and after and then you can decide if you want us to take a deeper dive on it. So, um, and I love your last question here. What is your why for selling and is it reasonable? You know, that goes back to, does it fit in your plan? But I love the way you couch it as what's your why. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you don't have a really good why for doing this, that might be a good indication that you need to step back for a minute and just wait give it the 24, 48 hour rule. <laughs> this is test. a 48 hour one probably. Yeah, yeah. And maybe 72. So just be sure. Cause this is a big move, big purchase. As we said, it's generally the largest asset that you'll own unless you're a business owner. And so be, be very um, judicious as it relates to this kind of purchase and really any kind of major purchase, but homes, once you're in, it's tough to get out uh, without some major costs. So mm -hmm. Be sure it's a good move.